Navy planes dominated in the Pacific War. Fighters, the Grumman Cat series, the Wild Cat, the Bear Cat, the Tiger Cat, and the Hell Cat. Hellcat pilots shot down over 5,000 Japanese airplanes in the Pacific. The late Alex Vashu, the Navy's fourth ranking ace, said that he loved his Hellcat so much that if it could cook, he'd marry it. Grumman's claim to fame in the aerospace field is their iconic Big Cat line of Navy fighters, dating back to the F-4F Wildcat in the late 1930s. The carrier-borne fighter designs that began with the Wildcat and ended with the F-14 Tomcat of Top Gun fame were chiefly fighters. Their names were taken from different feline species or during the World War II years, a derivative of the cat name with an adjective in front of it. Grumman's first fighters for the U.S. Navy were barrel-chested biplanes. Known only as the F-2F and the F-3F, they had no nicknames. It is striking how few different types the U.S. Navy operated during World War II, particularly from carriers, and how nearly all of them were either totally brilliant or just awful. The Grumman Aerospace Corporation, now known as Northrop Grumman, made history, providing combat-proven carrier fighters to the United States Navy. Each of these incredible fighter aircraft were not only advanced for their day, but would have Grumman's unique style of being named after cats that became near synonymous with Grumman's Navy fighters. guy is a patriot. Let there be no question that he's maintaining, he's flying, he's keeping the airplanes um, for us. And, and I truly appreciate that. But go ahead, Rod. I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Well, thank you. I started out, I guess, in 95. First, I wanted to recognize one other pilot that's out in the crowd. Gordon, where are you at? Gordon. Gordon, there he is. Way yeah, in the back? He's our resident Bearcat pilot. I don't know why you're not up here, but okay. <laughs> anyway, we'll get you involved. So Gordon flew the, the Bearcat in, and he flies this Bearcat most of the time. I've actually got three Bearcats plus a race Bearcat. Okay. And Stu can talk to you a little bit about that. But I started out in, back to your original question, started out in uh, about 1994. I, I was really interested in, uh, in the Warbirds from 86 on. Didn't have enough money to buy one. So about 94, bought my first one. It was a T-28. 95, uh, we brought it to uh, Oshkosh. It won Best T-28 wow. at, uh, in Oshkosh at, in that year. <clears throat> and then um, about a Whirlway. So those were, I had a tail dragger and tricycle gear, and I just flew those, mainly because my dad was in the Air Force 22 years, and he flew the T-28A. I happened to buy a B model with a bigger engine. So that's kind of how I got my start, and I just loved it from then on. The next aircraft I bought wasn't until about 2005, and it was an NA-50. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Chuck, it was at Chuck Yeager's uh, grass, it was a Grass Valley uh, Airport. Went there, he helped me look at it, we checked it out, and uh, I bought that airplane. And then I bought a, a Mustang, and it kind of just went on from there. Went so on from it really there. started in about 2005. Okay. So. And now 36 airplanes later. And, and growing or stabilized at this oh, point? Growing. Okay. Yeah, I've actually got a Hellcat. It's been seven years in the making, and I hope it's here next year. Okay. It we'll was keep... supposed to be here this year. So uh, thank you, Evan, for bringing yours. We'll keep so, our fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. Well, what we're going to try to do in this program today is we'll start with the – 
the, the beginning of the cat series here. So we'll start with the, uh, the wildcat, and then we'll work our way up through uh, the hellcat, through the bearcat, and the tiger cat. And so uh, with that, I'll say, okay, um, this uh, wildcat that's here is uh, one of yours, correct? And uh, from an acquisition standpoint, where did it come from? Oh, boy, it, it, you've got the history on that one. But it came from the bottom of Lake Michigan. Okay. Conrad, so you got any details out. on that one? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, so the, the wildcat we see here is a pretty special wildcat in that it's the only true Grumman-built wildcat. There's probably about 13 wildcats still out there in Airworthy, uh, 12 of which were all built by the General Motors company. So it, it is a rarity, and it's, it's here today because it was lost in Lake Michigan in 1943 and spent 50 years underwater before it was brought back up and restored to flying condition. Um, it is also an F4F-3, so all of the General Motors aircraft were a different engine and a different arrangement. Uh, this aircraft, the wings do not fold uh, because they hadn't invented it yet. The F4F-4, the, the next variant, was the first one to get the folding wings. But this is the same airplane that would have fought for the United States in the early war period. This is our first fighter that we had going into World War II. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize the airplane as well from many of the early battles, Wake Island, Guadalcanal. This is the particular type that they had to fight those battles. Uh, as the years went on, they, they made improvements to the airplane, and uh, they ended up going into full production on the Hellcat, so they passed off the manufacturing over to General Motors Company, and they started building FM1s and then the more powerful FM2, which is what we normally see. Uh, but a very neat airplane. We, we brought it up last year. We did some talks about it, and uh, we left it here at the EAA Museum for them to showcase throughout the year and talk more about it. And uh, we came up here a couple weeks ago, did all the inspections, test flew it, got it back into the only airworthy F4F-3. So we'll be flying it in the show, and uh, we'll be bringing it back to San Antonio to join the rest of the collection. Outstanding. How about, what was the limitation? Why, okay, we, we had this airplane, and, and it fought, and it did okay, but, but we wanted something better. What, what were the limitations? Why, why wasn't it good enough to go fight against the Zeros, et cetera? Well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit with, with Grumman. Grumman started in December of 1929, and what they started doing was building uh, floats with this very odd retractable landing gear. And they would use those floats on a different manufacturer of airplane, but it converted the aircraft to be amphibious. So that's where they got their start, and they started doing a lot of odd jobs, building truck bodies and uh, all sorts of things to get by. But they decided they would build their first aircraft and try to win a military contract. And that first aircraft started out as a biplane. The, the FF-1 mm -hmm. was the first one. And they made different iterations of the airplane, the F-2F, the F-3F, all biplanes. And the F-4F originally was going to be a biplane, but the Navy said, you know, we're done with those. We want monoplanes. That's the way of the future. So the F-4F was converted over to be a monoplane. But the uh, F-4F was just the, the most advanced thing we had at the time. And uh, when we first got into battle with Japan, I think we, we had a rude awakening in that they had a very well-performing airplane. Somehow they had come up with the Zero, and the Zero could outperform the Wildcat. But the one thing that we had was a lot of good guys that came up with tactics to combat the Zero, as well as a very strong airplane. Uh, Grumman has always been referred to as the Grumman Ironworks because they built their airplanes just extremely tough. They could come home with a lot of battle damage. They had a lot of things that the Japanese didn't, didn't want to put in place, nor could they put in place for some reasons. Uh, but Grumman would put self-sealing fuel tanks, which helped protect the pilot. They put more armor plating, helped protect the pilot and get them home. Whereas the Japanese Zero was a lot more lightly built and didn't have some of these amenities. So the Wildcat was the best that we had, but it, it still wasn't a great comparison to the Zero that we knew nothing about going into the war. But 
quickly found out it was a formidable fighter. So the, the Zero basically could outturn it, could outclimb it, could probably outdive it. And yeah. we sat there and we said, hey, we needed something better. Yeah, they, they, uh, they had a task at hand trying to take on a Zero. A Zero was much more maneuverable, uh, higher power to weight ratio. But they found that they could, you know, there's a chink in the armor. They could shoot these things and they would light up and go down. Mm -hmm. So they had to devise tactics to be able to get a shot on them. Yep, I understand. All right, from there now, and um, we'll, we'll stop a little bit with the Wildcat. We're still doing okay on time. Um, okay, so we, we had to do something better, and so that something better was obviously the Hellcat. We, we bumped it up, and we said, okay, um, you know, hey, is, is this now a formidable uh, counterpart to the, the Zero? And uh, I think that's what they came up with. So, Evan, I'll turn, you, uh, turn it over to you for a minute just to talk a little bit about the Hellcat. Sure. Well, the, <clears throat> the Hellcat was designed, obviously, by Grumman. And what they did is they brought a bunch of Wildcat pilots in to help them figure out how to make the Wildcat better. They wanted to make an improved Wildcat, and they came up with the Hellcat. Um, you know, flying the Wildcat, they're great airplanes, but they do have a little bit of limitation factor. They're they're wheelbase from center wheel to center wheel is 68 inches, so it's very narrow. Mm -hmm. And of course, being an aircraft carrier airplane, they'd point into the wind and you don't have much of a crosswind. But the Hellcat, they wanted a more stable airplane. The Hellcat, obviously, you can see the gear is very wide. Uh, they changed the engine. It's an R2800-10, which is 2,000 horse. It's 18 cylinder. Um, they first flew the Hellcat in June of 1942 and it had its first kill in September of 43. Um, and the, the Hellcat, you know, it's not the fastest fighter, but they designed it and for a 200 hour farm boy to fly in combat. Mm -hmm. And th that's what they did. It's the easiest flying fighter that I've ever flown. Um, you know, and it's very rugged. I know there's uh, a story of a Hellcat landed on a carrier with over 200 bullet holes. Wow. Very rugged, they could be shot up, but um, so the, the Navy awarded Grumman the contract to get the Hellcat going, and they produced an amazing mount. Uh, 12,275 were built, and uh, kind of a crazy fact, the, uh, the factory heard a rumor that they were going to start laying people off, so they really started producing. And the war production record for an airplane is on the Hellcat, and they produced one an hour at peak. Wow. So they were pumping those things out like crazy, and the Navy actually told them to slow down. Um, well, that's a true story. But um, So out of those 12,275, there's about 26 airframes left, and that's from a pile of parts on a pallet to this airplane here, and there's seven that are deemed flyable. Um, and of those seven, I would say you know, one to three on a given day are actually flying or in an annual. Um, but the Hellcat could take a lot of punishment. It had three 50 caliber machine guns. Each had 400 rounds, each machine gun. It could hold uh, eight rockets or up to four bombs, depending on the, the uh, armament uh, mission, I guess. But, um, you know, the top speed is not flashy like the Corsair, but their carrier qualifications were really good where the Corsair was struggling. So it became the Navy's go-to fighter for a long time. And um, it just really took hold of uh, being the mainstay fighter. Um, the Grumman, or the, the Hellcat shot down 5,163 airplanes, which uh, equaled 56% of all uh, naval kills in World War II. And it lost 270 Hellcats to combat. So at a 19 to one uh, kill ratio, which was the best of World War II. Um, and David McCampbell was brought up in that video. He had 34 kills, which I believe was the highest scoring Hellcat ace. Um, and the Hellcat was the first airplane uh, to fly with the Blue Angels, actually formed the Blue Angels with the Hellcat and then later went right to the Bearcat. But uh, it's a great flying airplane. Um, you know, uh, last year we had Don McPherson here, who's a Hellcat ace and he's still with us. He's 100 years old and uh, got to know Don, and he, he talked about how rugged it was in combat and how much punishment it could take. And, you know, when you fly this airplane, it's just the, the gentlest airplane. It really has no bad habits as long as you're doing what you're supposed to, and it's uh, just
just a, a great platform. How about the acquisition of this particular airplane? Where'd this one come from? This airplane was uh, Yanks uh, out in Chino, California. It was there, I think, since 1976. And um, I kind of pestered the owner for about three years, trying to get him to sell it. And he finally did. And then we brought it over to Planes of Fame. And uh, Steve Hinton Jr. took this project on. He was here last year at Warbirds in Review with, with us. And um, we uh, flew it um, you know, about a year and a half ago for the first time. And uh, it was a very good restoration process. The Hintons are first class. You can't beat them. And uh, they, they built a great airplane. So, yeah, I'll say now afterwards, y'all have a chance to walk around these airplanes, take a look at them, because the rebuild process has been just absolutely tremendous on all of these things here. And the Hellcat in particular, we did that last year, and uh, and yeah, it was spectacular. Um, how about top speed? Compare uh, top speed on the Wildcat versus top speed on a Hellcat. You MB? know, that's what do you what do you consider top speed on the Wildcat cruise? Well, I don't know that there's a number. It actually, one of the benefits of the Wildcat is it will hit terminal velocity. Uh, you can be full throttle straight down, straight down, and it will stop going faster. So the neat thing about the Wildcat is it really doesn't have any gauge markings on the airspeed indicator. The, the flaps are vacuum, so if you're going too fast, they just won't come down. And uh, I guess there would be a limitation on the gear, but, um, you know, it, it's pretty rugged itself so uh, I don't know that there is a speed huh, okay and you know the Hellcat I'm, I'm thinking about 210 knots cross country is you know but they had a very high red line 420 knots okay I can't even imagine getting to that you know mm -hmm. but uh, Hellcat's built like a tank mm -hmm. and um, it'll just keep going but it's not the fastest fighter flying over here with my dad in the P-40 he had to Give me a couple inches so I could stay caught up with them. But we were <laughs> doing pretty good coming over. About 266 knots with the tailwind, so yeah, that's not can't bad. complain. That's not bad. All right, let's move on to, uh, <clears throat> I, I, and arguably now we're getting into the bear cat, tiger cat category. Um, and I'll start now, just because I think it's a cooler airplane. Well, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with the Bearcat. So we'll, 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 the, the expert here, and I guess over here too, is... is uh, uh, is Stu up here, um, and he's flown these things for a long time. He's raced these things for a long time. Um, and, Rod, you said you own you own three normal kind of Bearcats and then that one called Rare Bear. Right, a Dash, dash 1, 1-1, one dash one, and two Dash 2s, and then a modified okay. Bearcat. So. All right. And, okay, Stu, I'm going to put you on the spot now. What do you think about the uh, the Bearcat? How about how about starting out with with – the strange one with rare bear. What do you think about racing that thing? That's not a bear cat. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't fly like a bear cat. Okay. It's uh, highly modified. It's got so much chopped off the wing. Uh, the wing folds, when you fold them, they're about that big. Okay. Um, the engine's been changed. We're running a 3350 versus the 2800 okay. and a highly modified 3350. And how much horsepower are you getting out of that thing? Well, it's kind of debatable. You know, they say this, they say that, but yeah. we're we're turning the airplane, you know, 2800 is, is all you turn at 3350. We, we turn at 3200, and we're pushing about 80 inches of manifold pressure out of it. Wow. So it's... Yeah. It's it's doing it's a little good. rocket ship. It's right. it's a rocket ship. Uh -huh. um, we have to blow the struts all the way up to be able to land it and not get the prop. Yeah. So your approach to the field is your nose way up in the air and oh. you just hope you see runway as you come across the runway and then no land flaps. It. No flaps. No flaps. No, no, no flaps. No flaps. No flaps are weight. You yeah. throw those away. <laughs> Understand. And so, I got to ask, how how successful were you in Rare Bear? I did. We raced it what, right? Four years? Yeah, three four. years? Yeah. I raced from 2007 to when we quit. Yeah. So. And I got to just second. Okay. Yeah. And it and it. W the next deal was going to be nitrous oxide. <laughs> <laughs> and that that puts it over the top because it ran when it was somebody else's airplane. It ran nitrous oxide, and it was a hoss. Huh. 
Mm-hmm. But you got to have your nitrous guy has to be really good, mm-hmm. or it's just going to go bang. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so that's the race side of it. How about how about the normal airplane? Again, they stepped up. They sat there and they said, "Okay, we've got the performance from the Wildcat. That wasn't good enough. We got the performance from the Hellcat. We want to bump it up from there." And hey, Bearcat, uh, and they jumped that thing up there. And primarily, it was a weight thing, wasn't it? Didn't they really weight and horsepower? Okay, so talk about that. So, the Bearcat is is the most maneuverable one out here. Maneuverable as in maneuverable turning? and flight, and I mean it's it rolls good, it climbs good, it does everything really well. Um, it's not a hard airplane to fly. It's it it's you know pretty uh, pretty docile if you just do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's light as it can be. A uh, Bearcat is is just one of the nicest ones to fly. Didn't it have a, a climb to time uh, record for a while I, there? I'm not sure about that. Gordon? Okay. It did. Okay, that's what I thought. I thought I like it was a, you know, three, three minutes. Three minutes to 10,000. Three level to 10,000. Yeah, that's what that I thought. That was the criteria that it was built under. And that's what they were looking for. They wanted they wanted climb performance out of that thing. Yeah. They lightened it up, it still had big motor. Yeah, but they were doing that and pushing 50 inches and ADI and everything, and they, it, would, it would go. Okay. It would go. Okay. But it's 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 a very well balanced airplane, mm-hmm. and it came unfortunately a little bit after the war. It really didn't yeah, see much. It didn't see a whole lot, uh, which is unfortunate. But it was very popular on the air show circuit too, wasn't it? I absolutely. Mean, yeah. Blue yeah. Angels. And and did well. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely. So that's 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 the next step, and now we jump into this Tiger Cat thing, and uh, I got I got some some personal experience. With, with a friend of mine who flew the Tiger Cat, and that was a couple of years ago. I, was it, I think it was two years ago when, when Connie uh, Bowen flew in with, with Stu, as I remember. And, uh, yeah, she lit up her, was it her left or right wheel? Left wheel. Left wheel li- li- uh, lit up. They had a little bit of a problem. And when a magnesium wheel hits concrete, oh, there's lots of sparks. I'm here to tell you. There's lots of sparks. The good news is no harm done. Um, as I remember, they jacked that thing up, took the wheel off, put another one on there, and you flew another, you know, three shows or whatever it was with it. But uh, but that was that was that Tiger Cat. Um, there are two other Tiger Cats here, and I don't know who wants to start talking about the Tiger Cat. Rod? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll say I'll pa- a few words about it. Yeah, I, I think the well, that's kind of my go-to airplanes. That and the P-38 okay. are kind of the airplanes I, I really love to fly. I think uh, two engines. You know, at, at, at some point in your life, you want a second engine. I understand. So uh, the thrust, the, the takeoff power is incredible. It's a short field if you want it. Both 2800s, right? They're 2800s yeah, on, on each wing. Three, yeah, yeah. CBs and, and the ones that we have. And uh, just they're very maneuverable. They're, they're a little heavier, of course, than the Bearcat. Mm-hmm. Um, they're tough to fly in formation because you've got those two engines. But... But they're, uh, you know, it's just a very safe airplane. It's uh, docile, stalls, you know, very gentle, uh, just like any Grumman. Uh, so, I, you know, it's just an incredible airplane to fly. S- Speed-wise, it's probably straight off the assembly line. It's probably the fastest of any of these. Can I, I say yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. I, I, when I was racing, I raced uh, the silver one out there. Uh, I set the track record at Reno for 3.99. And that was 50 feet off the ground in the pylons, so that was, you know, we're banking the whole time. Wow! So it'll 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 go. And know? what's the difference between these two airplanes here now? Not much. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty much the same. Both dash threes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And how about acquisition? Where did they come from? Uh, this one came. This is the first one that I bought, and it was it came from the museum. And what was the name of the museum? Uh, I'll think of it here in a minute. Yeah, it's got a. The other one was Lone Stars. Yeah, Lone Stars. Uh, I actually bought it from Mike Brown. Mm-hmm. He was racing uh, this Tiger Cat, the, the, the other one, and it was called Big Boss Man. And then I changed the paint job, and then, then I raced it after that. The other one was from Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo, yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, this blue one. Okay. And, and maintenance-wise, are they... Uh pretty easy to maintain or are you constantly trying to work on these things we've got some guys that really know what they're doing okay. so I, I think the maintenance is just kind of a regular maintenance schedule parts uh, parts uh, we haven't had a too difficult of a time okay. we can find parts for them 
Okay, and I got to ask the same thing. How about parts on the Hellcat? Difficult, easy, hard, expensive? Depends on what you're looking for. But if anybody needs Warbird parts, we sell Warbird parts. So <laughs> shoot me an email. <laughs> okay, and how about on a Wildcat? Uh, the Wildcat's fairly easy to work on because it's a simple airplane. Um, but yeah, parts are getting harder to come by. You end up just pulling the original microfish film from the Smithsonian and building what you need. Okay, thanks. Um, just to let you all know, uh, this morning was kind of a special morning. We, uh, we gathered out here, I think the first brief was 5.30 or something like that. And um, it, the, the short story is that uh, Breitling was involved. Um, they wanted um, to get involved with warbirds and they did. Um, we had them here with a breakfast. They had uh, a B-25, they had these two Tiger Cats and four P-51 Mustangs, um, and they all pre-briefed, and uh, they wanted to go fly and take some pictures. And so that's what they did. Um, it lasted, what, about an hour or so? Hour, a little um, over an hour, yeah. And uh, as I remember, I think B-25 took off first, circled left, um, and I think the, uh, the, the whole crowd joined up over top of the field. We watched a nice um, uh, formation takeoff, by the way. I watched the, the two Tiger Cats <laughs> took off in formation, and that was kind of cool. Um, and then uh, they joined up on the B-25, and then the, uh, uh, the four Mustangs joined up. And uh, if, if it works, if you all take a look at the big screen, and I'm going to take a look here, I think we can coordinate so that we can show some of the stuff that went on here this morning. Um, Scott, uh, back in Sleeping Dog, uh, promised me that uh, he'd be able to do some of this stuff. And yeah, this is the flight this morning. Uh, you, you can see, see what, and you guys, yeah, you can stand up and take a look too. Um, but this is what went on this morning. And we had, uh, there you go, that's the, uh, that's the flight that went on this morning. Some good, good formation flying, a lot, of, a lot of aluminum in the sky out there. Ray Fowler, I don't know if he's in the audience or not, he was flight lead. He was flying uh, the first P-51. We had uh, Paul Draper as number two, uh, Wes Stowers uh, number three, and uh, Lumpy, L oh no, I think it was Lumpy who was uh, number three, and Wes was number four. Um, and so those were our, our, our Mustang pilots out there. And uh, I'll just, I'll open up. Stu, what do you think? Was it a good flight, bad flight? Did you have fun? Yeah, it was good. It was okay. good. I think they got what they wanted. It was uh, a little cloudy, and we had to kind of hunt a little bit to make it all work. But the clouds, you know, they add something to it. Yeah. And uh, once we all got settled down and everything, it, it worked out real well. Yeah, total flight time was probably, what, about a point eight something like that? Yeah, yeah. close to an hour. Okay, like close that. to an hour, yep. And, and as you can see, yeah, they had some, uh, some great fun up there, good formation, and... Uh, and some beautiful, beautiful airplanes. Uh, first thing I want to say is I'm a Navy guy, and I'm in heaven looking at all these airplanes, and I want to thank everybody who was involved in restoring them and bringing them here. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, and I'm just curious, what's VMC on this Tiger Cat? Well, Doesn't really have one. Yeah, we've probably pushed it to 450. Uh, oh, yeah, you go 450. <laughs> VMC. No, VMC. They oh, said VMC. VMC. Oh, VMC. Okay. I can't. They can't. They don't really publish you a VMC. They publish you a speed that you should fly. Okay. They don't say this is going to roll on you right now. But it 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 really depends on how much horsepower, how heavy you are, as to how what kind of speed you're going to have to carry. It's not a published VMC. And for those of you who aren't pilots out there, VMC is ve Velocity Minimum Controllable. That's what that stands for. Okay. Now, if, you, if you're dragging a bunch of tanks and everything, you're going to have to up it. Yeah. Probably 170. Oh, no. It's 120, 130, somewhere right, right, right in there, yeah. depending on how much you're dragging. Yeah. Okay. And it, yep, okay. You, you don't want to find it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to find it. That's correct. All right, other questions. All right, we got one over here. Kind of a, what kind of approach speeds do you see different from uh, from all four models right here? Are they all similar in approach speed for landing or uh, or slightly different? Uh, I'd say the Wildcat's probably the slowest, and um, I hold about 100 mile an hour indicated 
throughout the, the short approach, and then it probably touches down around 70 or... Uh, it's a three-point attitude touchdown, so 65, 70 maybe. It's it's fairly slow. And I go over the fence with the Hellcat about 85 to 80 knots. 100 knots on the Tiger Cat. Bear Cat about 90. Okay. So they're all, all close. Yeah. They're all in the ballpark for a Navy airplane. All right. I think we get another question over here. I, uh, first of all, I like the second the appreciation for bringing these beautiful airplanes up here. Um, I don't see any guns on the bear and the tiger. Where are the guns? There's some guns on the tiger cat. Fake. <laughs> on the second tiger cat, oh, the second on the one silver one. On the combat, yeah. on the combat yeah. model. How about the bear cat? Where would they? Nothing on them, but uh, yeah. the bear cat would have had, what, 450 calibers? Yeah. Six? Six. I'm not sure. This airplane didn't come with guns, and, and we've never outfitted it with guns. So it's uh, it's faster without them. We don't tend to need them much nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> How about the Hellcat? About I don't know. <laughs> Hellcat had what? Had six? Six. Six fifties yep. on it, right? Yep. Okay. That's what that had. All right. More questions. All right. There is one. I see one right there. Oh, wait a second. Have you guys ever done a dogfight with a Corsair with the Hellcat? Or do you know of how well they perform against each other? He probably has. I haven't. I, I've never done a dogfight between the two of them. I've flown both of them. And both of them are, are, are really nice. I mean, they hang on and do. But I'm, I'm thinking the Hellcat would probably take that one because the Corsair is not as fast. A little touch on you know, some of the Grumman technology. Uh, the Wildcat kind of started it, and then it, it followed up through the models. But uh, I mentioned the vacuum flaps. The flaps were set up in such a way that you could select flaps down during combat, and they would stay up if you were going fast. But if you started to get into a turning fight, the flaps would slowly start to come out and reduce your turning radius. So that was something that the, the fighter pilots didn't have to play with. They'd set it to flaps down and go fight. And uh, if the Zero wanted to utilize that, they'd have to manually do it. The Hellcat incorporates uh, basically the same system, but it's electric. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a youngster over here. Go ahead, sir. Which is, which is the nicest to fly? What is the nicest to fly? What is the nicest to fly? Okay, we'll go down the road. Well, I what haven't flown the Hellcat yet, so I, I would say the Bearcat. Okay. Yeah. Stu? I, I got to go with the Tiger Cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I've only flown the Wildcat and the Hellcat. I like flying them both, but I really enjoy the, the Wildcat. Okay. Conrad? Uh, yeah, the Wildcat. There's, there's bliss to simplicity. Yep. So, Conrad, how many cranks to get the gear up? Yeah, the, the Wildcat's a little more involved. It's, like I say, more <laughs> manual. The landing gear is a big hand crank on the right side, and I think it's about 29. I'd, I, I seem to be doing other things, so I'm not counting. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you watch it fly, it's, it's kind of a different takeoff. What we do uh, may be different with others, but uh, the faster you go, the harder it is to crank. So on takeoff, it's a pretty, pretty high pitch angle. And we're trying to keep it around 100 mile an hour indicated so that there's not too much pressure on the gear. But you, you crank it up, and when you do so, you've got to duck your head down. So you take a break and see what's going on outside and go back down and keep cranking. <laughs> but it adds to the fun and to the, the history of the airplane. Those guys had to do, do it just off the carrier um, back in the war. Wow. Wow. All right. We've got another question over here. Could you? Could you comment on the Wildcat's paint scheme? It looks like Butch O'Hare's paint scheme. Yeah, this airplane, uh, it's painted say, up. Say the question one more time. I think people uh, had a paint it. scheme on the okay, Wildcat. The paint scheme. The paint scheme is Butch O'Hare's uh, livery. So the this airplane obviously is not the exact airplane that he flew, but uh, this airplane was, was in training here in Lake Michigan and spent a lot of time underwater, but it was uh, rebuilt and painted to uh, be the same scheme as Butch O'Hare. And if, if some of you have seen recently, uh, Paul Allen did an expedition and actually found the USS Lexington at, at 11,000 feet deep in the ocean. 
and they got video of the actual Butch O'Hare Wildcat. Wow. Wow. Okay, another one over there. Yeah, just just uh, curious about the, uh, the fuel burn, and you always hear about oil burn. Come fuel on. and oil burn. Okay, let's start with the, uh, the Wildcat. Uh, well, what are you burning, uh, fuel-wise, fuel gallons per hour? It probably does about 40 gallons an hour, maybe a little bit less. Okay. Uh, and then oil, it, it doesn't burn much. Uh, maybe a gallon every four hours. Okay. How about the Hellcat? Hellcat, I'd say the first hour, if you're using climb power and you're going up high, is maybe 75 gallons. And after you level off, it tapers out to about 55, 57 Okay. For fuel and oils, probably, you know, a gallon every three hours, something okay. like that. Okay, and how much gas do you carry on the Hellcat? Uh, 87 and a half in each wing, and then it's got a reserve of 75. And then, of course, if you have a drop tank set up, which I don't, so. Okay, how about it on the Wildcat? How much gas do you guys carry? Uh, generally, it's 126 gallons in a belly tank, and then uh, this Wildcat has a small tank in the back, about uh, 26 or 30 gallons or something. Okay. How about the Bearcat? What's that carrying? Bearcat, well, you, you figure 75 to 80 an hour now. If you okay. pull the RPM on back, that's where you'll gain your mileage. Okay. And how much gas does that thing hold? Uh, this one holds two, or should hold 213 in, okay. in the front tank. All right. And how about the Tiger Cats? How about uh, fuel burn on those things? Fuel I know. burn, we figure about, in crews, about 135, 135 gallons an hour. <laughs> That's pulled back. And we carry a drop 680 gallons. Okay. Cost a little bit of money to pull up to the. Yeah, I was just doing the math in my head there. Pump. Yeah, 130 yeah. gallons an hour. <laughs> okay. Yeah, somebody do the math yeah. out there and tell me at the price of Avgas. Wow. Okay. That's impressive. All right. All right. We got two questions over here. All right. Go ahead, youngster. Tiger Cat see any action of World War II? Tiger Cat see any action during World War II? No okay. action. It, it was actually a little late to the to the war. I think it would have been a hell of an airplane. It was a reconnaissance airplane after the war. So it came out about six months after the war was over. So no action. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Tiger Cat could carry so much armament. Yeah. I mean, it's just a brute. Mm -hmm. And it, it was designed as a two-seater, correct? Well, the first one was a single-seater. Okay. And then they added the back seat okay. on, on the twos and the threes. And then I think they even did it on the late ones, but the twos and threes and fours had all back seats. Okay. Okay. What about Korea? What about what? Korea. Yeah. Korea. Uh, the Tiger Cat Korea saw the action in Korea. Um, it, it, it had different roles after the war, but... Uh, you know, question specifically, World War II, it was too late for World War II. One of okay. the things that was real good about the Tiger Cat is it became a fire bomber, and it was fantastic. And everybody liked it. It would carry a large load, and they could get down in the valley and then drop their load, and they could come out of there because mm -hmm. it's got so much horsepower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another one over here. I got here a little late. And I haven't heard much about the P-38. The reason is I'm a gold star son, and my father was killed over France on a P-38. And we found the crash site, and he said it was the best fight. He thought it was better than the P-51. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the P-38 we're, we're not going to be talking about today, oh, I don't I'm think. Well, I wasn't here yesterday. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> but but as long as we're talking about that, and, and thank you for your father's sacrifice, I'll yeah, say that. Absolutely. But, but what I would like to do, and I always do this in my presentations, I'd like those who are serving on currently active duty or uh, in the reserves or uh, veterans, I'd like you all please to stand up. We'd like to give you a hand. So active duty, veterans, reserve. Thank you for your service. All right, we got another question down up front. I just, just had a wildcat question. Uh, can you compare the right powered versus the Pratt powered? Yeah, um, so I, I've actually had the opportunity. The, I rebuilt an FM2 in 2013, which Evan now owns. Um, 
and I, I'm, I guess, one of the few to fly both of them recently. But uh, the FM2 had the 1820 Wright engine, which was 1,350 horsepower, and it was supposed to be what they called the Wilder Cat. It added power, and they pulled out a little weight, what they could. Uh, so the FM2 is a great performer, but I would say the Wright 1820 is a little bit more rough engine. Uh, it beats you around a bit more. This particular Wildcat, the F4F-3, has an 1830 Pratt & Whitney, which is a twin-row 14-cylinder. So right off the bat, it's a lot more smooth and uh, just just a, more enjoyable to fly. A DC-3 motor. Yeah, so this particular airplane has a DC-3 motor, a Dash 94, which is more horsepower than what it would have had in the war. So this particular Wildcat has equal horsepower to the FM-2, but... It doesn't have the folding wing, and it doesn't have all the guns. It's got four guns rather than six, and uh, it has been lightened up, armor plating and whatnot. So anyway, this one is a particularly good performer uh, versus the FM2. So I, I, I got to say, I do enjoy this one a little bit more, uh, but they both have their, their advantages. Thank you. All right. Uh, we got one. Go ahead up, up top there. I understand that the Bearcat has a little bit of an unusual wing structure, spar structure compared to other planes. Could you explain that? Spar structure on the Bearcat. Stuart, you want to take that one? I have not rebuilt one of those, so I can't really comment on the wing as, as far as the structure and, and what's in there. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I can give you a little bit. All right, there we go. I was going to say, we got another Bearcat guy over here, too. He might know. I'm not sure, but go ahead, Conrad. <laughs> I, I don't know what you're referring to exactly, but the, the Bearcat originally was do designed with uh, kind of a special feature where the wing tips would come off. If you over g the airplane, the wing tips would come off and reduce the load on the spar. So that was uh, an attempt to make the airplane lighter uh, by underbuilding the spar, uh, but still not having any aerodynamic failures. The bad thing about that, if one came off. Yeah. So one would come off and, and put you into a uh, fun situation. So they ended up just kind of going away from it. And uh, what we deal with nowadays is a little bit of an underbuilt spar. And I don't know the particulars about the spar, and I've not rebuilt one, like you said. But uh, this one, you can see, has a spar strap. There's a cap that's been added to give a little extra strength. And then some of the newer Bearcats that are being rebuilt are, uh, are being built with a heavier spar, a different material and, and a, a better spar. There's another way to do that. Cut the wings off like bear and don't worry about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what was top speed? What did you get out of rare bear? I'm just curious. Last time, uh, it was 490-something. Okay. Qualifying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Up top. Yeah, is, it, is, it, is it possible to visit your museum in San Antonio? Yeah, it, it is. Most of my airplanes, I've got a ranch just west of uh, San Antonio, and that's where most of the aircraft are right now. But there's probably half of them at each location. And, yeah, the one in San Antonio, sure. <laughs> All right. Sounds like he's going to visit. All right. We've got another one up top here. Yes, you don't read too much about the Tiger Cat going ab aboard the ship. Do you? Can you address that at all? Or were there any uh, squadrons that deployed the Tiger Cat on a short ship? You know, it, I, they were made to land on the ship. Yeah. I can't tell you whether they ever landed any yes, on the they ship. Yes, they did. They did. Okay. They were aboard the boats. But yeah. they, they wasn't, the airplane was made for that, but it wasn't used primarily for that because it worked good off the land, yeah. too. And it has good range. We can put 300-gallon drops, uh, one in the middle, and then got some on the outboard. So it'll go a long ways. And one of the things, one of the characteristics about landing this airplane is it is made to land on the carrier, so the struts are really uh, stiff. If you don't slam it on, it's gonna it's gonna come off sideways and it's hell you know when you're taxiing it's hell to taxi off the runway if you're going the wrong way so we try to land firmly uh, when we when we land one of these unlike the others where we want to grease them on okay all right one more 
uh, equipped with tail hooks, or, or how did they land on carriers? They, they had tail hooks. Okay. And, and, and yeah. as far as catapults, that came after, uh, after their, um, their They use? didn't need it. Yeah. None of these airplanes uh, took off with catapults, but uh, they all landed with a tail hook. And, uh, yeah. yeah and you would put your flaps down and get one of these off and 1,000 feet. Yeah. If you start inspecting them afterwards, you'll start to find little hooks uh, up in the wheel well areas. The Wildcat's got a little hook in the center in between the landing gear. The Hellcat. Yeah, you can see them right behind the. Yeah, they're there. So they, they did have some board. hooks for a bridle and a catapult system later. And then uh, one of the Grumman uh, benefits was the tail hook was not truly exposed. Uh, it would. Uh, suck up into the back of the tail or be fared into the tail so it wasn't hanging out like you normally see but they are uh, tucked up in there somewhere it's it's tucked up in there on the on the f7 it's just about you can't see it yeah. and i will say there's going to be a a cat flight do we know when i don't think we do yet where they're going to have the hell cat, uh, it's the this cat. afternoon, and I'm not sure. I've got a briefing at 11 Oh, now. Yeah, yeah. But there's two guys that need uh, to leave <laughs> now. But, uh, but yeah, they, there is going to be a cat flight where we're going to have the tiger cats, the hell cats, the wild cats, and the bear cats, I think, all flying together. So that'll be a, a, a celebration of the cats. And, yeah, this afternoon, it sounds like, is when we're going to be doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. One last question anywhere? Nope. All right. With that, I'll say, first of all, Rod, thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. It, it, it's it. been a pleasure. Thank you for being uh, the caretaker of these airplanes. And, Appreciate uh, it. And Stu, same thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Keep thank flying you. safe out there. Evan, thank you. Conrad, thank you. You bet. Thank you, folks, for coming. This afternoon, we got two ME-109s that are going to be parked out here, and it should be a good show. So thank you all for being here. Meet the Hellcat, the F-6F, a single-engine, semi-low-wing combat airplane equipped for use on Navy aircraft carriers or as a land-based fighter. As the ground crew prepare to start the engine, they follow a carefully planned routine that should be understood by all pilots. After the mechanic in the cockpit signals that the ignition and starter switches are off, the prop is pulled through three or four revs in the direction of rotation to clear the cylinders. A live cartridge is placed in the breech of the starter. And after locking the breech, the mech secures the access door. Power flaps are open, as they should be for all ground operations. Carburetor air directs manually. The plane captain is careful to see that no crew member is on the wing stuff and that the man in the cockpit keeps his arms inside. These precautions will avoid possible injury. With engine running, the hydraulic system pressure gauge should show a pressure of 1,500 pounds per square inch. This pressure is necessary to engage the wing locking pins and operate the safety locks. After the wing folding hydraulic valve control has been set to run, the outer wing panels are swung forward to join the wing stubs. Then the safety lock is pushed down and to the right, mechanically locking the wing hinge pins. As this locking operation is completed, the red indicating cylinder on the wing recedes until it is flush with the surface. There's nothing unorthodox in the proportions and appearance of the F6F. Likewise, there is nothing unorthodox in her flying characteristics. In fact, experienced pilots say that she flies like a trainer. At service loading, she has a gross weight of about 12,000 pounds, but her 2,000 horsepower, double row, WASP engine endows this airplane with unusual speed and climbing ability. The landing gear is sturdily built to take the shock of carrier landings, and the wheels are widely spaced to give maximum directional control. When you man this airplane for the first time, 
Bear in mind that you are about to fly a fighter equipped with an engine which will develop 2,000 horsepower. You must have an intimate working knowledge of all our instruments and controls and know how to get the most out of a powerful engine within the prescribed limits of operations. Use of the safety shoulder straps is mandatory in this airplane at all times. Adjust your seat so that you have proper vision through the reflector sight on the instrument cowl. And be sure the rudder pedals are adjusted to suit your leg length in order to give you full positive control. Before you leave the line, increase manifold pressure to about 30 inches and check your mags by moving the ignition switch so that the engine operates momentarily on each magneto. A drop of 75 to 100 RPM is considered normal, but if RPM loss exceeds this, malfunctioning is indicated. The hydromatic constant speed propeller should be checked at an engine speed of approximately 1,800 RPM. Pull up the prop control to the full low RPM position and observe the tachometer, which should show a loss of approximately 500 RPM. Then return the prop control to the takeoff RPM position and if the RPM returns to its original value, proper operation of the prop is indicated. For close adjustments, Turn the vernier clockwise to decrease RPM and counterclockwise to increase the RPM. In order to prevent an accumulation of sludge in the blower clutches and to check on the operation of the auxiliary blower, set the throttle to give an engine speed of 1400 RPM with prop in full low pitch and mixture control in auto reach. Shift blower control quickly from neutral to low auxiliary stage. And when instruments have stabilized, you will notice slight increase in manifold pressure and engine RPM, accompanied by a slight drop in oil pressure. A further shift of the blower control from low to high should be followed by another small increase in manifold pressure and engine RPM, but oil pressure will remain fairly constant. Be sure and return control to neutral in one quick positive move. Finally, check your ammeter to be sure the generator is charging properly and don't leave the line unless it is. And don't forget to unlock your tailwheel. As you taxi out on the field, don't exceed 1,000 RPM. Use your rudder to maintain direction and avoid overuse of the brakes. Visibility from the cockpit is excellent. There is little need of S-turning to see ahead. As you make sharp turns, try to keep the inside wheel moving a bit in order to avoid rubbing off the tread. When you arrive at the takeoff spot, let the plane roll straight forward a few yards to align the tailwheel. Go through the checkoff list carefully and deliberately. Don't trust to memory. Follow the list item by item. Wings locked. The red indicator will be retracted flush with the surface. Gas tanks full, giving you a fuel load of 253 gallons. 87 and 1 half gallons in each of the two main tanks and 78 gallons in the reserve tanks. Mixture control, automatic rich. Blower, locked in neutral. Prop control, set for takeoff RPM. Electric fuel booster pump, on. Power flaps, open as necessary. Elevator tab, neutral. Rudder tab, one and a half degrees right. Aileron tab, neutral. Tailwheel, locked. 
wing flaps up. You can't gun this engine to full takeoff RPM and manifold pressure while holding the plane with the brakes. If you exceed 2,000 RPM, the tail will lift and you'll risk nosing over. Start your takeoff by easing the throttle forward until you have 45 to 50 inches of manifold pressure. This is ample power to fly you off, but you can pull up to 54 inches if necessary. The F6F has very little tendency to swerve and will fly yourself off at a speed of about 60 knots. Now let's go back and try a carrier takeoff with flaps down to give a shorter run and a quick positive lift. The flaps are electrically controlled and have no intermediate position. The control switch is pulled back to lower the flaps and pushed forward to retract them. If the electrical control fails, you can manipulate the flaps manually. Be sure the handle is depressed before moving the lever. If necessary, use the hand hydraulic pump at the right of your seat. safely airborne, 500 feet or more, retract your landing gear and bring up the flaps. Also, switch off the electric fuel pump. If your mission demands it, you can climb for not more than five minutes with military power using 52 and a half inches of manifold pressure and 2,700 RPM in neutral blower. For normal requirements, however, you will throttle back to rated power or less and move the mixture control to auto lean at all power conditions except for takeoff and military power. For normal rated power, use 44 inches of manifold pressure and adjust the prop control for 2,550 RPM. At approximately 5,500 feet, You'll reach full throttle. Allow the manifold pressure to drop to 41 and a half inches. Throttle back three to four more inches to prevent exceeding low blower manifold pressure. Open the intercooler flaps. And shift quickly to low blower. Use 49 and a half inches for rated power in low blower. You will reach full throttle at approximately 15,400 feet. Allow the manifold pressure to drop to 47 inches, throttle back 3 to 4 more inches, and shift quickly from low to high blower. Use 49 and a half inches in high blower to continue rated power climb. The full throttle altitude is approximately 21,800 feet. Of course, at this altitude, you will be using oxygen as needed to protect against anoxia. Watch the cylinder head temperature closely. When cruising, never let it exceed 232 degrees centigrade. 260 degrees is permissible for takeoff, military, and rated power operation. Your oil inlet temperature also is important and never should be allowed to go above 95 degrees. Keep an eye on the fuel quantity gauge too, and when operating on the reserve tank, watch for the warning light that flashes when this tank is down to 50 gallons. For minimum fuel consumption, use 1300 RPM and 30 inches below 5,000 feet, which will burn about 40 gallons per hour. Now, while we have a safe altitude of more than 10,000 feet, let's observe the stall characteristics of the F6F under various conditions. Here, the airplane is approaching a stall with power on and wheels and flaps up. There's little warning in the way of buffeting, but as the stall becomes imminent, controls will be sloppy and ineffective. At close to 62 knots, she'll stall fully and fall off. Smart, prompt action brings about a normal recovery. Now let's observe a power-off stall in the clean condition, where the stalling speed will be approximately 65 knots. The nose comes up and gets very heavy, 
Response to controls is sluggish. She shudders a little and falls off. But again, normal recovery is brought about by the usual methods. With landing gear extended and flaps down, a power-on stall will occur at about 53 knots. There is very little tendency to spin if prompt action is taken to regain control and recover normally. For a power off stall, with wheels and flaps down, the stalling speed will be close to 58 knots. Again, no adverse characteristics will be experienced, and the usual technique of regaining control brings about prompt, normal recovery. The behavior of the F6F in dives is largely dependent on good pilot technique. Her stick forces are fairly light, and response to all controls is quick and positive. There is no dive checkoff list, but the required preparations are simple and easy to remember. The throttle is retarded to give 15 to 18 inches of manifold pressure, and the prop governed for 2,000 RPM. Cowl flaps closed. Rudder tab a few degrees left. Elevator tab neutral. After you push over into the dive, adjust your tabs as may be necessary to maintain your flight path. Don't let your speed touch more than 390 knots indicated, and don't exceed 7 Gs under any loading condition. Make a smooth, easy recovery to guard against blacking out, and also to avoid putting undue strain on the airplane. This airplane is not restricted and may be flown through such maneuvers as the slow roll, which is entered at a speed of 170 knots, the loop, which is entered at 190 knots, Emmerman entered at 200 knots. As you come in for a normal landing, go through the checkoff list with deliberation and care. Tail wheel locked. Fuel on best tank, in this case the reserve. Mixture control at a ridge. Prop control, take off RPM position. Flaps down. Landing gear extended. But don't do this until your speed is 110 knots indicated or less. There's nothing tricky about the landing characteristics of the F6F. Bring her in with a little power at about 80 knots indicated. When you have the runway under you, cut the gun and set her down for a good three-point landing. She'll touch at 60 to 65 knots. Let her slow down somewhat before you use your brake. Then you can bring her to a full positive stop without heating them up unduly. Now let's watch a field carrier landing. Make your approach a little slower than for a normal landing, about 75 knots. 
but keep your eyes on the signal officer, not the airspeed indicator. When you get the signal, cut the gun and let her hit the mat. In a real carrier landing, you may hang on the wire and bounce, but your oleos are built to take it. When you are ready to taxi to the apron, pick up your wing flaps and open the cowl flaps fully to keep cylinder head temperature within prescribed limits and prevent scorching the spark plug elbows. As soon as you have wheeled into your parking spot, the plane captain will give you the signal to cut the engine. Advance throttle to give about 1200 RPM for 30 seconds, then move the mixture control lever into idle cutoff. As soon as the prop stops rotating, cut your switch and wait for the plane captain to call out, all clear. Call out to the plane captain, switch off. Finally, shut off the fuel valve, turn the battery switch to off, and cut all other operating switches before leaving the airplane. As this picture has demonstrated, the F-6F has no adverse flight characteristics. She is relatively easy to fly, and her armament packs a real wallop. Appropriately named the Hellcat, this airplane is known to be a match for any adversary, a fact already proved by the results of actual combat.